I'm often told video games cannot age. As if there is something unique about a video game making it immune to time compared to other forms of art or entertainment. In 1986, the Ford Taurus was winning awards for radically pushing the American sedan forward. Top Gun was the highest grossing film of the year. And of course in Japan, a little title called Metroid was unleashed to the public. A year later, Western audiences would get their shot at defeating Mother Brain. When the dust settled, millions of carts were sold and Metroid would go on to become an important franchise for Nintendo, with sequels still being developed as of the release of this video. So what was it about Metroid that captured the hearts and minds of the gaming public? Let's dive in. First, I want to talk about what Metroid is missing. There is no score counter, and a player cannot earn points. This may seem trivial today, but it represents both a radical departure for the time and some serious forward thinking. The goal in Metroid is not to earn a high score. Instead, the objective is to defeat Mother Brain. The second important design decision is the non-linearity of the adventure. The player doesn't travel from point A to point B along a set path. Instead, a player must explore planet Zebes, gather resources, and plot their own course to the final showdown. This idea of exploration was revolutionary at the time, and players could spend hours exploring the numerous areas trying to uncover all of Metroid's secrets. Secrets. At its core, Metroid is a simple game. The protagonist Samus can jump and shoot. Using these two skills, one is then tasked with defeating two space pirates, Kraid and Ridley, unlocking the final area of Zebus and ultimately the final boss. However, Samus begins the game rather weak. Her primary weapon is lackluster with limited range and her jump is unremarkable. Players will soon find areas where they are unable to progress, cluing them in to turn around and find upgrades. This non Nonverbal communication to the player is good game design, and the concept of needing upgrades to progress further into a non-linear world forms the basis of the Metroidvania genre, which continues to enjoy popularity to this very day. Within the first few minutes of the adventure, first-time players will likely hit a dead end, forcing them to backtrack and look for an alternate path. While backtracking, players will find the first upgrade to the iconic power suit. The Morph Ball allows the player to travel to previously inaccessible areas, a form of progression gating. While often used as a negative term, well-designed progression gating allows a designer to control the pace of the adventure, offering opportunities to teach and communicate gameplay elements to the player without resorting to text boxes, tutorials, or other nannies. Players will notice their weapon opens blue doors, but red doors remain closed, hinting at future weapon upgrades. Another screen features an enemy below the main path again cluing the player into a future upgrade allowing access. Another area contains a door just out of reach of Samus's jump range, again cluing the player into future upgrades. From a design perspective, Metroid initially feels thoughtful, with logical clues to progression, an uncluttered UI, and a simple control scheme. While Samus begins with just a jump and pea shooter, upgrades don't complicate the controls, and there is not even an inventory screen. The Morph Ball is activated by pressing down for example, and is deactivated by pressing up or jump. Once the missiles are acquired, they can be toggled with the select button, and a palette swap clearly communicates to the player which mode they are in, which is important since missiles are not infinite. There's also a bomb upgrade for the Morph Ball, letting the player drop bombs and make progress in obvious areas, or used offensively against shorter enemies, as so Samus cannot crouch. All is not perfect though. Samus starts with just 30 hit points, despite her max health being 99. With the limited range of the initial weapon, awkward enemy placement with the initially limited abilities, a new player will want to grind for health randomly dropped by enemies in order to not die and have to restart at the beginning. Thankfully, the player retains all upgrades upon death, meaning Metroid has unlimited continues and an exhaustive password system, keeping track of everything including health upgrades, destroyed doors, and even the current missile count. While the password length may have been somewhat annoying to Western gamers in 1987, the choice was absolutely correct, though I still don't understand why the developers chose to restart the player with just a third of their health. Now, with the first two areas of Zebus explored, the player has a choice to make. Either make their way to the sub-boss Kraid or the sub-boss Ridley. Being a non-linear game, players truly are free to make their way to either. Whichever path is chosen, by exploring each branching path of the game world, the player will find energy tanks, adding another 90 
99 hit points to Samus's power suit, and missile upgrades, adding an additional 5 missile capacity each time one is located. These are the dangling carrots, offering a tangible reward for searching out each of the game's many branching paths. On my recorded playthrough, I headed east though, because of the additional upgrades offered in Norfair. First is the high jump, which allows access to the Varia suit, reducing the damage Samus takes when getting hit, and second, the screw attack, which turns Samus into a weapon when jumping through the air. The combination of a longer hang time with the high jump and one hit kills with the screw attack transforms Samus from a fragile soldier to a formidable bounty hunter capable of saving the human race. And it is at this very moment Metroid starts to fall apart. Before making any real progress towards the goal of defeating the space pirates or mother brain, the player is fully powered up. Every area of planet Zebus is accessible to the player, and the wonderful game design present for the first third of the adventure all but disappears. The most pressing issue is the design of the world itself. Many areas feel the same, with long corridors or towers featuring repeated and reused art assets, color schemes, and layouts. I found this redundant in the original Super Mario Brothers, but in Metroid it can be downright confusing. When areas look the same, the world can become disorienting, making it extremely confusing for a player to remember exactly where they are in the world. This is especially problematic in the Norfair area, which lacks a beltway. Instead, the area is littered with numerous branching paths, all eventually leading to dead ends. Without a beltway or interconnected paths, the player is forced to backtrack through similar looking areas and hopefully navigate to a new path leading the way forward. A more logical game approach would have been to reward one of the numerous power-ups for traversing through a long, winding, and dangerous corridor, and then allowing the player to use the power-up to access a shortcut back onto the main path, rather than forcing one to literally backtrack through the same hazards a second time. Don't get me wrong, energy tanks are a fantastic reward at the end of long corridors, which will be exceptionally handy for defeating mother brain, but the overall item and upgrade progression feels lopsided, skewed towards the first half of the game, and their overall utility towards a well-designed world is never fully realized. Instead, the designers went in another direction for progression, bombing random walls and floors. Now, at the beginning of the game, it is hinted differing colored blocks can be bombed, and this is in fact used early in the adventure to hint at progress, but later on, the game completely removes the hints, instead forcing the player to randomly bomb walls and floors to find near mandatory items along with a path to Ridley's lair, who must be defeated to unlock the bridge leading to the final boss. And it is here one might begin to wish Metroid featured a map. Zelda's dungeons featured similar looking rooms, making it difficult to pinpoint where they were in relation to the dungeons as a whole. However, a map was available, giving the players the information not present in the labyrinths themselves. Metroid lacks this foresight. The map present in the game's manual isn't strong either, only hinting the player needs to move downward and suggesting to use bombs to uncover secret passages. However, the sheer amount of areas to bomb is exhausting, and the game could have used either a map alerting possible bomb points, like the aforementioned Zelda, or visual clues would have greatly alleviated the padded out feeling of a first time playthrough. In fact, the game is so cryptic, I'm not even sure Nintendo of America was aware of all of the secrets found within Metroid. The manual incorrectly states there are six energy tanks, for example, leading me to believe NOA wasn't aware of two ridiculously well-hidden energy tanks hiding in breakable walls. Another low point in the adventure are the bosses themselves. Ridley is a joke. Just stand in front of it and fire missiles until it dies. Kraid isn't much better, just brute force into it so it can't block the missiles and it goes down quite easily. Both are anticlimactic, far easier than the journey it took to reach them in the first place. Now, one could say the journey is more important than the destination, and I think there is some merit to this, and like many, I find the awful bosses far less problematic than I probably should. So, the first third of Metroid is exploring Turian, Brinstar, and Norfair to obtain all of the power suit upgrades afforded to Samus. The middle act is traversing the two sub-boss areas and defeating two space pirates. The final act is then making one's way through the remaining part of Turian and ultimately reach Mother Brain. This final area of Turian features the Metroid enemy of the game's namesake. Now, I haven't really discussed the various enemies of Planet Zebus, and this is because the enemies are not very good. With the screw attack, all 
can be defeated with a single jump, and with the Ice Beam, anything remotely tricky can simply be frozen in place. I forgot about these when talking about the power-ups, but Metroid offers two additional projectile upgrades, the Wave Beam and the Ice Beam. By the time I reached my recorded playthrough, I just stopped obtaining the Wave Beam. Whatever advantage it has over the Ice Beam are negated by the freezing capabilities of the Ice Beam. Enemies can be frozen and used as platforms, and Metroids are immune to the Wave Beam, so its existence is basically pointless. But yeah, the Metroids. The manual explains these must be frozen with the Ice Beam, and then hit with five missiles to be destroyed. Unlike every other enemy in the game, I appreciate how these actually utilize the power-ups and require strategy to defeat. They cannot be cheesed by the screw attack, and because they can latch onto Samus and quickly drain health, there is a real sense of danger when one pops on the screen, giving the player a sense of urgency to quickly subdue the foe or surely pay the consequences. If a player fails to freeze them in time, they will latch onto Samus, quickly draining her health. The only way to break free is to crouch into a ball and use bombs, again utilizing the game's items and mechanics better than anything else found in the adventure. I desperately wish more encounters were as deep as those in the final area. Last, but not least, is the encounter with Mother Brain. In all honesty, this is one of the most aggravating things I've experienced in an 8-bit game. I think the intent was for the player to freeze the ring enemies with the ice beam before blasting away the Zebatite with missiles. However, with the three-directional aiming and tight corridors, this is far easier said than done. Not to mention one could easily freeze a ring in the way, blocking progress. As one is likely going to take damage anyway, it is quicker to just ignore them and take damage while blasting away at the canisters, which regenerate if not destroyed completely. Thanks. These control limitations and cramped corridors are even more obnoxious when one finally reaches Mother Brain, thanks to the acid floors. If one accidentally falls into the acid near Mother Brain, forget trying to get out. Death is all but certain. The one saving grace is the previously mentioned password save system also tracking which Zebatites have been destroyed, meaning one can make it back to Mother Brain with a full stock of missiles and plenty of health, ensuring average skilled players have the possibility to actually beat the game. It is a thoughtful touch, and one I can appreciate immensely. Sadly, and most famously, the player restarts with just 30 hit points after death. This is mostly a non-issue until the end of the game. As noted earlier, there are 8 energy tanks hidden on Zebus, and not only do these add an extra 99 hit points to the power suit, it refills the health to maximum. On my recorded playthrough, I plotted my course through the game accordingly, grabbing energy tanks when my health was low, avoiding a lot of grinding. Of course, by the end of the game, the strategy doesn't work. This meant when I inevitably died during the final boss, I had to grind away for countless minutes to replenish both life and missiles, which is boring and feels like a needlessly cruel punishment for the ambush presented. In fact, item drops in general are a real crapshoot. Defeated enemies will either drop health, missiles, or nothing. If one is maxed out on health, enemies will still drop health. Same goes for missiles. There is nothing worse than reaching a red door with four missiles and then praying to the RNG gods to drop a fifth missile so one can actually progress. And when I play Metroid, this is what I feel. I feel like I am wasting a ton of time grinding and backtracking, like there wasn't always a rhyme or reason as to why items and power-ups are where they are. Not to mention the endless wall and floor bombing trying to progress forward through the adventure. First time players might also get stuck fighting a fake boss or find themselves down a path with no power-ups. Granted, one might argue most of the upgrades are not necessary, but for an average player, energy tanks, missile upgrades, the high jumps, area suit, and ice beam will be mandatory to finally destroy Mother Brain and save humanity. So, if the game is as thoughtless as I am proclaiming, why is this one so beloved? Like seriously, it is still a top 10 game on many best of lists. Well, in my subjective view, Metroid is what I would consider a cool game. It does a decent job capturing early 80s sci-fi. It clearly draws inspiration from and pays homage to Ridley Scott's Alien. One of the space pirates is named Ridley after all. Many of the areas have a Geiger-esque vibe to them as well, with a lived-in, grungy feel. Combined with the haunting music, Alien was more horror than sci-fi after all, and Metroid does offer something completely different than the more 
all-American action hero focused games of the time. It really does stand out on the platform and the era really, and viewed through a certain bubble, there is definitely some appeal here. But when I step out of the bubble, Metroid feels sloppy. Even the visuals aren't especially pleasing. Samus looks more like a xenomorph than a female in a power suit, and the running animation can best be described as goofy. The background is also always black without exception, and most of Zebus is just a sea of repeating tiles. It looks like it was created in 1986 and is nowhere near the upper echelon of NES games. Games developed just a year later are far more visually interesting, and while some of the music is decent enough, some repeat far too quickly, and the shrill of certain sound effects are about as appealing as the black backgrounds. This lack of audio and visual polish is baked into the gameplay as well. Despite being a world-renowned bounty hunter with a power suit augmenting her abilities, Samus doesn't feel precise. To its credit, there are two different jumps. From a standstill, Samus can jump and make slow changes to her trajectory. This is helpful when trying to land on small platforms. The second jump is while in motion, allowing for further distance and enables the screw attack once located. However, the player is often forced to do the long longer jump and land on small platforms, which is incredibly tricky. There just isn't enough mid-air control to allow for precise landings, causing the player to miss and land on a hazard. The screw attack isn't precise either, sometimes just not damaging an enemy at all. In tight corridors, it can be especially finicky, with its engagement only registering in specific circumstances when a jump height is low, as a player won't want to block their path forward with a frozen enemy, and certain enemy types are regenerating immediately after death. At times, the most efficient path forward is just to soak up damage, which looks about as graceful as it feels. Metroid feels sloppy in other ways too. When entering a door, enemies on the screen continue moving, inflicting damage on the helpless protagonist. The programmer should have either made Samus invincible during this period, or stopped enemies, alleviating the issue. I found this vertical climb up temporary blocks to be infuriating. Samus will often get flung off the tower, forcing one to start the journey all over. There are also timing issues where the player is expected to jump up a secret area and then hope a block regenerates below Samus at just the right time, allowing upward progress. Again, it feels sloppy, and the block should have been designed in a way where the player wasn't relying on strange time. Timing. With all of that in mind, I don't find this to be a top NES game, or even a particularly good game for that matter. I can still appreciate what it was, an ambitious sci-fi horror game. I appreciate the lack of a score, and there isn't the pointless timer which continued to play games well into the 90s. The designers clearly understood a home console game offered unique advantages to game design, and I applaud them for designing an adventure letting go of the quarter-munching mechanics of its contemporaries. Metroid also features alternate endings, giving players a tangible reward for replaying the game. On my recorded run, I finally finished in under three hours, rewarding not only an alternate ending sequence with Samus and a leotard, but the player can then start a new adventure with the new sprite, which is pretty rad. And for the first part of the game, Metroid has some excellent moments of game design that would be replicated and perfected for years to come. Metroid is so damn good at the beginning, clearly communicating to the player to return to certain points points once a new item is obtained, and then rewarding a player when they figure it out. This logical progression and reward system is excellent, but once it comes to an end, what is left is underwhelming at best, and oftentimes rather poor. Metroid lacks a map, but doesn't give the player clues on where to bomb walls and floors. Metroid is thoughtful enough to save most mission data with the password system, but always restarts the player with 30 health points, regardless of how many energy tanks one has acquired. The backtracking 
thinking is incredibly asinine and pads out the overall experience. It isn't hard to imagine a version of Zebus with a more thoughtful layout, either by level design or item design, allowing the player back on course with shortcuts thanks to new abilities. The jumping controls often don't match the platform layout, and enemy patterns don't match Samus's weapon arsenal. The concepts and ideas presented in Metroid are fantastic, but the execution is often lousy, which is a real shame. Like many things from the 80s, I just don't find Metroid has aged all that well. Top Gun may have been entertaining in its day, but the writing and story are shallow, and the movie is certainly showing its age. I feel a similar affliction towards Metroid. It may have been wildly groundbreaking and entertaining in its day, but now it's about as appealing as a 1986 Ford Taurus.